Okay, there we go. Um, so I'm Jennifer Hawkins. I'm the edible crops agent here with the Molokai Cooperative Extension Service. And this is actually our second avocado lace bug or ALB workshop that we've had. So Jensen Ueda was over um, about a week and a half ago. And he actually, he and I actually presented um, for the, um, on the, uh, the insect side. So we talked about um, the conditions, some of the conditions that the bug liked in the life cycle. And then we also talked about um, chemical control and the different options for chemical control. And then at the end, we actually did the uh, mist blower. So we turned a, uh, a leaf blower, backpack leaf blower into a mist blower. Uh, just for those producers who may have really mature trees and, and decide to spray and want to get a little higher up in the trees underneath the leaves. And so um, Jensen and I were talking and we said, hey, you know, it seems like here on Molokai, there's a little bit of varietal difference. And he said, hey, we're seeing the same thing on Oahu, but it may not be the same varieties. And so look, and, and the same timing on those varieties. So uh, why don't you get with Dora? And Dora and I connected and, and so here she is. So we have Dora Stockton today with us and she is with Agriculture Research Services, which is a part of USDA. Um, and she's located over on Hilo. And then we also have Mac Bosch, who is going to be presenting uh, some data as well. And Mike is a, a, a post op for here. I think he comes to us from Wisconsin, to Hawaii from Wisconsin. And he's now located um, over on um, on Hilo. I think I said post op, post doc. <laughs> Some more so pure. Um, so anyway, I want to uh, thank you all for joining us this morning. And at this point, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to um, Derek. Well, before we do, let me just say that um, originally, uh, I think we were, we had uh, heard about um, avocado lace bug over in Oahu on Big Island and some really major things happening over there. And then a um, little on Maui. Um, and then we we've seen it um, on Kauai, and now we've seen it on Molokai. And as we had our last workshop, what we started discovering is as people were familiar with the the um, uh, what the leaf looked like and the the damage appearance, um, and then also the life cycles of the insect, we actually started. Uh, getting calls and responses from people who had attended the workshop that, hey, they've been seeing this longer than just the last month or longer than just right now. And we first it's saw it at East season. End and then immediately uh, got a response after the workshop of, hey, we've seen it um, down Mahana site. And then uh, next thing we know, we've seen it in Hoalehua and so then Kalai. And so it seems like it's all over the island. And so rest assured, if you see this, you're not the only one. I just want to make sure that, you know, you're not the only one on Molokai, um, that there are others. And um, I think that it's just out in nature now. And um, so it's not like it's spreading from one into the other. It's just there. Uh, so now with that said, I'm going to turn it on over to Dara. And um, Dara, I think I've made you co-host, so you should be able to share your screen. Yes, so let's begin. I'm going to cast this. Okay, so let me know, guys, what you guys are seeing. Do you see my presenter view or do you just see the full screen slide? The full screen slide is what I see. Good, that's what we want you to see. Um, yep, so today we're going to share a little bit of data. I'm glad that you guys have already talked with Jensen, so you're familiar with this pest already, at least most of you probably are. Um, there's been a lot of stuff in the news, too, about this. Um, we started working on ALB uh, late last year. Um, it had been in the island since 2019, but wasn't a major issue until um, early 2021. Um, that was the first time the growers were on a widespread basis really reporting that this was an issue on our island, and it was causing quite a bit of panic. Um, 
early after it was detected on the big island it's you know since spread everywhere it's possible that it's been in molokai for you know even as long as a year and a half and it just kind of went undetected um because unless you know what you're looking for or know to even pay attention to it, I think it, it just went unnoticed. And it also seems to take quite a while for the numbers to initially build up after an initial infestation. And we'll talk about that a little bit. So I'm sure you've seen um, large pictures. This is a little bit grainy, but I just wanted to show kind of a blown up uh, picture of the actual pest. Um, they are just small sap-sucking hemipterans, so similar to white flies or aphids. Um, they feed on the internal uh, liquids in the leaf, um, but luckily they do not carry disease. So the damage that they cause is direct mechanical damage to the plant and it causes you know, the leaf to eventually drop. Um, the adults are very easily identified by their unique lacing pattern um, that's very distinctive and they have that dark band right across it. There are some other species of lace bug. To my knowledge, there aren't any in um, Hawaii, um, but all the same, um, it's not a, a particularly widespread type of insects. It's not the kind that you would see necessarily all over the place. So they're pretty distinctive. Oh, here we go. Um, so one of the questions that we asked early on because we realized there really was um, a lack of information about the pest. Um, very little has been published on it, very few reports exist, and we didn't even know how to sex these. So this was actually one of the first things we had our technicians working on, <laughs> was just something as simple as that. So I wanted to show this to you. Um, as you can see, the females are slightly larger than the males. Um, and Jennifer, correct me, I, you might have already seen some, you might have already presented some of this, so some of you guys might be saying yeah no. we know but <laughs> and we have but new people can... with this as well oh good. okay so the females are slightly larger um and they they're characterized by this um this rounded abdomen which is unique uh the males instead have a, a slight protrusion at the bottom um but really to the naked eye without some type of magnification i mean may, with a hand lens you might be able to see this but it's really going to be hard to sex um without without magnification because they are quite small um that, if you had a really good eye you might be able to but 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 maybe not but they're they're very very similar um the site of reproduction we've noted is um is exclusively on these mature leaves so on the left side of the screen you'll see the the blushed leaf that's new growth and they're very tender and you might occasionally see an adult or two on that leaf but um, you'll never see eggs. Um, we don't know um, how extensively they're feeding on these, but they do seem to wait until that leaf matures to start reproducing on it. Um, so if you're doing scouting, um, the focus should really be on those mature leaves. Um, and it also is an indication that as far as management is concerned, you know, if your trees are in new flush, that's not really the time to be so concerned about the plants because the numbers, I mean, they're not going to be reproducing at that stage. Um, so once the females pick a leaf that they start to lay eggs on, we've been trying to determine how many eggs she will lay and approximately how long it takes for those offspring to develop. So um, right now it looks like the females will lay anywhere from 30 to 50 eggs total. Um, but she might spread those over two to three leaves. So this is a close up view of what that looks like. Um, and what you'll see are a few different things that without, again, magnification, all kind of look the same. Very small little, little black splotches all over the bottom of the leaf. So on the left side, you see an egg and those are identified by what you can see is a little round tube-like opening. Um, those eggs are often covered in a tar-like excrement that's very dark and sticky, and that is their feces, and you can see a feces droplet on the far right. So again, without magnification, you might think that you're looking at a bunch of eggs, but it could in fact just be frass. So that's some of where the difficulty comes in in trying to do monitoring um, with the naked eye. Now in the middle, what you see is a reddish looking nymph, and that is 
probably a first in star. It's reddish in color, which is indicative of juveniles that have just recently hatched or molted into the next stage. They tend to be bright red and then darken over time. And then at the top, what you see is an exuvia. So those are the cast skins. So as the nymphs mature on the plant, they leave their cast skins behind them. And so this can be confusing again as well if you're scouting your field because um, you might think that you have an active infestation, which could in fact be an old infestation if what you're seeing are cast skins from a previous generation. Oh, here's a few more life stages that you can see. Again, there's some frass on the side. We have a few different instars though. So on the far right, there's the first instar exuvia. They're small shriveled kind of cast skins with the leg shells and all of that. Then in the middle, you can see a newly enclosed second instar nymph that's bright red. And those are easily recognizable. And then finally, the very large third instar nymphs. And those are easily identified, but what you can see are developing wing buds. And it's hard to tell in the picture, but just kind of right in the middle area, you see these, um, these lateral protrusions, and those are the developing wings underneath. So if you're seeing mobile um, nymphs on your plant, that's a good indication that those are um, viable and that that needs treatment. Um, but the, probably the easiest thing to recognize to know if you have a, at least historical infestation problem is leaf blotch. So when we do our scouting um, for our trials, we will usually pick leaves that have an identifiable medial blotch. So you don't wanna find something that has um, browning along the edge of the leaf. Instead, the ALB blotch will always be in the middle of the leaf and using that to kind of narrow in where you're going to look for things and um, then actually searching for what appear to be moving nymphs or adults. Help, you know, management in Hawaii. Um, you know, as researchers, we have to think about these systems fairly holistically. So we have to be interested in both the biology and the ecology as well as the management so that we can get good management. But these are some of the questions that we've been focused on in the past year. So I wanted to share some of these data. Um, one of them is what time of year are AOB most problematic? And our hope is that by nailing this down, we can help people determine when they need to be most focused because we know there's not just one thing that you're having to work on in your farm. You know, you're scouting for different things at different times of the year. So we wanted to see if our populations of ALB here in the islands are the same as what they see, say, in Florida um, in terms of seasonality. We also wanted to look at cultivars, and I think that's probably what Jennifer really wanted us to present on today, um, because we've been looking at whether the Hawaii cultivars that are most widely grown here have varying levels of susceptibility. After initially some growers reported to us that Sharwell seemed to be much more susceptible than say Malama um, compared to some of the other cultivars. So we wanted to look at that a little more closely. Um, and then finally, we've been starting to look at local predators. And I think that'll probably interest everybody as well. It's one of our um, favorite projects, trying to identify whether there's local predators that we can help recruit to the fields to help do some of the management and take some of the pressure off. So this work involves, and it's still ongoing, but um, this will probably end up being a two-year project in the end, but we're wrapping up the first year now where monthly we're going out to these four farm sites. So the first one is Tom Benton's farm, which is about 2,100 feet um, near Hananao. And uh, his farm is exclusively Sharwo, which is great for consistency. Um, we're also uh, collecting data from uh, Wakefield. So Brooks and Billy's farm, which is um, nearby, you know, Kealakekua, and it's all Sharwo and Malama. And then the last two, and these, these sites, um, Mike's gonna be presenting data from, um, I'm not gonna really get into that, but that's Ken Love's collection. There's 13 trees we've been sampling from all different varieties and also the UH Kona Extension Farm, which again, all different varieties. Here's what the Benton Farm data looks like. So we started collecting this back in October. We are still collecting data. In fact, I think Mike is planning to go out this week and go get a bunch of leaves for our September collection. But here is the data through July. 
And so what you see are two lines here, and this is the mean number of, of total ALB per leaf. And you'll see that the bottom line are the adults, and those numbers are relatively stable. So they were a little elevated in the fall, you know, around 15 adults per leaf with a drop as we moved into spring. And in the summer, now the numbers are well below, you know, less than five per leaf. So a little drop off in the summer months. In contrast though, we see a lot of interesting data with the juveniles. So the juvenile numbers are dramatically higher in the winter months. So peaking in January, and then a very big drop off here in March and into April with a continuing kind of steady decline through the summer. Um, and so in doing this, one of the things that we've learned is that if, you're, if we're doing our determinations of what stage of infestation a particular field is in, is that it probably is best to go with juveniles rather than adults. Because what we think is happening is that the adults are actually spreading themselves evenly. So once they come out and they mature from their clutch, they go and find a new leaf to found. So if you want to determine what stage of infestation your field is in, looking at juveniles can be a really good indicator. Looking at the Wakefield farm, we found a similar pattern. So again, the adults remained pretty steady with an increase into winter, you know, January, um, the numbers started to decline and again, relatively stable. So around five adults per leaf. But for juveniles, again, the numbers peaked around January and then had a dramatic drop off. Um, one thing we did note, though, is despite um, reports of Malama and Sharwell differences, at least from this site, we, you can see that these lines, so purple are samples collected from Malama trees, green is uh, our adults collected and juveniles collected from Sharwell trees, and the numbers are very similar. Now this, is, this could just be this one site, but um, we did think that that was interesting considering um, how, how much even the growers from this particular field felt that the Sharwell um, were more heavily hit when in fact our data showed that if you really counted the numbers under magnification, the numbers were pretty consistent. of a Sharwell canopy um, from David Cox's farm, a cane plantation um, back in March. And this was before his first, uh, his last big defoliation event. So um, what you see is that just before that happens, the leaves um, start to senesce. They turn, you know, dark golden color and they start to curl up and um, that immediately precedes leaf drop. Now I just want to go back one slide and say this. So at this point, what we see happening is that the population decline of ALB in the late spring, at least this first year, coincided with that leaf drop event. So once the tree loses its leaves, it starts to regrow new leaves and we already know that they don't reproduce on those. So that is a natural population bottleneck. The population crashes because they no longer have mature leaves to reproduce on and it takes a long time before those leaves mature and the populations can build up again. So of course, um, you know, for us, it's really important to look at how this compares to what other people have found in California. Um, and certainly there hasn't been a lot that's been published on this, but this is a report from 2005 from Mark Hoddle's group who we're in touch with. And they found that in California, after they detected ALB, they found the same thing. So the outbreaks tend to be worse starting in the late fall through the early spring and then a big decline. Um, and, you know, I think there was some question at some time about whether this was a purely temperature driven effect, but I think that what we're really seeing is that the populations are forced into to a decline when the trees lose those leaves.
So here's a figure from Florida where ALB was actually first reported in the early 1900s. So it's, it's endemic throughout um, South Florida where it probably arrived with early um, avocado tree plantings um, from even you know, several hundred years prior. But you can see again, um, in, in Florida's case, the numbers actually peaked around February, so maybe slightly shifted. But again, those numbers tend to correspond to what is likely a leaf drop event, in this case, sometime around April. Um, so that's good to know in that the numbers and the population dynamics that we're seeing on the islands correspond pretty closely to what people have reported with this pest um, in other locations, um, which hopefully also means that some of the tactics, tactics that they take to manage them actually do translate into what we can try here. So um, the plan going forward, is multi-directional. So Mike, who's going to be presenting in a moment, um, has joined the team as of this summer, and he's exclusively working on ALB for the USDA, and he's interested in a few different things. Um, one is how elevation and climate affect population dynamics. What makes us different in the islands compared to, say, California or Florida or even areas in the Caribbean is that we have an elevational climate difference depending on where you are in the islands. So two different growers in two different places could actually have some fairly different climate effects to deal with. And so we're interested in how that affects risk level and potentially how often and what your strategy should be for management. Um, and he's also going to be continuing to look at these cultivar differences and relative risk. And um, we look forward to updating you guys as we learn more. Um, the other big area of study is, is this work with local predators. So I'm collaborating with Dr. E.K. Shikana, who's assistant professor at UH Manoa, and one of his master's students. And we're actually about to start putting in an insectary planting in one of our research groves because we're interested in what we can do to naturally recruit local coccinellid, lacewings, and spiders into the field to help manage ALB naturally. Um, this is a picture that one of our techs took of a little steel blue ladybird nymph um, on, this, uh, on this leaf. They're one of the most common um, ladybug predators you'll probably see in the orchard, these um, bright blue beautiful little predators. So if you see their eggs or their, their larvae in the field, leave them be, you know, maybe give them a little cheering on because hopefully they're going to do good things for your farm. So with that, I will unshare my screen and turn it over to Mike. All right. Let's see. How do I unshare? Oh, stop share. There we go. Okay. <clears throat> Let's see if I can get this going. There we go. Is everybody able to see the uh, uh, slide up right now? Yes. Perfect. Um, yeah, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about uh, just the cultivar risk assessment and kind of some differences uh, that we've seen over the last year-ish in terms of ALB abundances uh, between various different types of avocado trees. Um, yeah, so like I said, kind of the, the uh, big goal in looking at this cultivar risk assessment was to really examine differences in ALB abundance um, and ALB preference uh, between different avocado cultivars. Uh, and with the ultimate goal of trying to answer the question of which cultivars are more at risk, uh, uh, particularly more at risk of experiencing early leaf drop uh, and these, these defoliation events, and from that kind of uh, uh, resulting uh, yield loss. So when looking at sort of this risk assessment, um, it really comes down to looking at this interplay between preference and susceptibility. So it's really looking at uh, what cultivars 
does the ALB kind of prefer to feed on? And how uh, uh, resilient are those trees, those particular cultivars um, in sort of withstanding uh, uh, leaf damage from ALB before experiencing these leaf drops? And so if we look at some of the previous literature, uh, both in California and in Florida, they do mention that uh, certain avocado varieties and cultivars uh, do vary in their susceptibility to uh, leaf damage from ALB feeding. And on top of that, uh, some they, they do uh, suggest that ALB does exhibit some preference for some varieties um, over others. And so what we did and kind of what uh, Dara was mentioning, uh, during these surveys, we surveyed some groves that were growing multiple different cultivars um, kind of in, in one sort of central location. Um, and of those cultivars, uh, what I'm going to show you are just some results in ALB abundance for seven uh, uh, different cultivars. These include uh, Bayshore, Haas, Kahalu'u, uh, Malama, Nishikawa, Sharwell, and uh, Yamagata. And so what I'm going to show first is just differences in sort of the infestation levels between these different cultivars over, uh, on average, over the year that we've surveyed these trees. And so what kind of right off the bat, what we do seem to see is that there, there's, first off, there's a lot of variety or variability in terms of these infestation levels uh, between these different cultivars. But uh, in particular, there are some cultivars that seem to have uh, higher infestation levels than others. Uh, these include Kalau'u, uh, Bayshore, and, and Sharwell, uh, which had kind of been mentioned earlier. But so what this is showing is just these infestation levels on average over an entire year. When we look at the month to month uh, infestation levels between these varieties, what we see is there's actually a lot of variation. Um, so some varieties might have, or some cultivars might have a lot of infestation one month, and then that might, it might that infestation might be very low the following month. Um, this this large variation might be what we think uh, is dependent on the the differences in the timing of different growth events for these trees. So. Uh, differences in the timing of flowering of you know these uh, stages of vegetative growth and just how the fruit is maturing for these trees as well and so we think that uh, this might also be kind of influencing um, these infestation levels and kind of how it's varying throughout the year so on top of just looking at these infestation levels what we've also done is we've taken the time to look at uh, what different sort of leaf traits or leaf qualities might explain why there are these differences between these cultivars. And so what we did was we did some uh, data collection on uh, a varying uh, a variety of different leaf traits, including uh, leaf thickness, antioxidant levels, um, turgid water content, um, antioxidant in this turgid water content, it's really just um, analogous to the, the leaf quality that the ALP is feeding on. So just those, those plant juices, um, how, how uh, uh, high quality is that for the ALP? And what we see in kind of all of these different traits that we measured is that there, there is a good amount of variability between these different cultivars. But if we compare any one of these measurements or these, these leaf quality indices to these infestation levels that we're seeing up here in the top left, um, there's no sort of one-to-one -one matchup. And so it, there, there really is no sort of smoking gun in terms of what, it, what explains uh, why you see ALB on more so on some cultivars versus others. So what this might mean is that it really is sort of a, a, a combination of a lot of different leaf qualities uh, that might be contributing to why you might be seeing uh, or why you might be getting this preference from uh, avocado lace bug. And on top of that, 
uh, those leaf qualities might be changing uh, throughout a given year, which again, uh, like I mentioned, might be dependent upon what your trees are doing in terms of their flowering, their vegetative growth, and their fruit maturation. And so we're kind of continuing some work on investigating more of these, these leaf qualities, how they differ between the cultivars. And again, just trying to map that onto these ALB infestation levels between these different varieties. So that was all looking at preference. If we look at susceptibility in terms of just what varieties seem to be accumulating a lot of damage from these ALB, uh, we again, we notice a lot of variability between cultivars. Um, for instance, when we look at just the amount of, uh, of this, these blotches, that, that how big these blotches are on these leaves compared to the, the size of the leaf itself, we see that uh, varieties such as Sharwell seem to have sort of the largest uh, uh, ratio here. So they, their leaves tend to accumulate larger uh, blotches of dead tissue. Um, but again, like, uh, like it was in the, for ALB preferences, there's a lot of variability uh, between these uh, different varieties. And as you can see, um, this susceptibility doesn't quite, it's, it doesn't have that one-to-one -one matching with this preference. And so again, there are a lot of other variables and factors at play here that are uh, really influencing how susceptible these trees might be. And so this is another kind of uh, area that we're continuing to study and to look at these different factors uh, that might be influencing just how susceptible these leaves are to damage. So again, from looking at these surveys between these different cultivars, we see that there is a lot of variability, not only in terms of how much ALB is, is on uh, a particular leaf or each of these varieties, but how much leaf damage these, these varieties are accumulating due to ALB. Um, and just looking at sort of preference and ALB abundance, we do see that uh, cultivars varieties such as Bayshore, Kahalu'u, and Sharwell, they tend to experience more ALB on average over a year. Uh, but like I mentioned, there is a lot of variability in this. Uh, and so what this seems to say, and this was kind of alluded to by Dara as well, is that, infant, that the infestation risk at in, any given time uh, may be dependent on the growth stages of your tree. And so the timing of these different growth stages, like when your trees are going to flower versus when they experience vegetative growth, that's going to be uh, specific to what type of cultivar you're growing. And it might even be more specific to the location. Um, and, and uh, uh, the weather that these trees are experiencing. Yeah, and just to jump in there just for a second, um, you know, with, with some other pests- Sarah, we can't hardly hear you. Oh, my boom was up. Okay, it's always, <laughs> every time. Okay, so it, you know, one of the things that we've been talking about is that, um, yeah, so if you're if you're really concerned about, you know, when you need to be paying attention to your trees in terms of ALB, and if you want to go in there and manage it, the best time is probably going to be just as those leaves are starting to mature. And that's going to be different for, for every tree, and it's going to be dependent on when that last leaf drop period was, but also the different cultivars are going to develop at different rates. So it's really on a case by case basis. Um, but what we still don't quite understand, and I think this is really the critical question that we're gonna be working on over the next year or two, is how do these different infestation levels actually affect yield? right? Because just because the trees are dropping their leaves doesn't necessarily even mean that there's a meaningful difference in fruit quality. So we are really trying to develop experiments that at, answer that question and for the, the, the biggest cultivars that are grown locally. So we're focusing on Sharwell, Malama, Kahalu'u, Yamagata, 
Nishikawa. And if you guys have any specific needs for a specific cultivar that you would like us to look at that's not on that list, um, feel free to reach out to me and let me know and we can see what we can do. But I think that that's going to be the really critical question. I mean, I think at this point, it's wise to, you know, use management strategies to try to protect your trees. But um, ultimately, we might be able to um, make help make recommendations that um, actually mean you don't need to worry about this pest quite as much um, if if yield effects aren't significant. So um, that is part of why these questions that Mike's working on are so critical. And uh, hopefully in another year, we're going to have more answers for everybody. Hi, Dara. Um, I have seen trees in um, this area, uh, Kula, and it seems that it's not uh, so bad that trees are infested, but they don't lose uh, too much uh, leaves and still still producing, but in very dry areas like Lahaina and the Kulak Park is, is dry. Uh, the trees uh, uh, usually lose all the leaves. Yeah. The next year uh, production is almost nothing. So the, the trees right. flower more for the next year. So do right. you know, that the, the weather oh, it's influencing to the damage of the... Absolutely. So Mike can kind of speak to this a little bit before he does. I'll just say, um, you know, like most insects, these, these ALB are, you know, have temperature dependent development. So at cooler temperatures, populations aren't going to grow as rapidly um, because it takes them just that much longer um, to go through their life cycle. So that could be a factor. But Mike's um, actually starting to look at um, low, mid, and high elevations around the, um, the Captain Cook area and trying to answer this question. But I'll, Mike, why don't you um, kind of address Rosemary's question a little bit more? Yeah, so um, depending on like weather, uh, like Dara mentioned, you know, weather is going to influence how quickly these this ALB populations grow, um, but it also is going to influence, you know, how much how stressed the trees are. So it could be in drier areas. These trees are a little bit more water stressed, uh, so that could uh, make their susceptibility or risk to infestation a little bit higher. Um, and on top of that, too, this can also influence sort of yeah the uh, the the timing of these different growth stages. Um, so it could be that temperature might create uh, uh, longer periods between uh, new vegetative growth. Um, so that might again allow these populations to accumulate. Um, so yeah, it it really comes down to you know how is the weather affecting. Uh, how these populations, how quickly these populations are growing, and how is it affecting, you know, the the tree as well? But you know, uh, to more directly answer Rosemary, I think that what you're seeing, we're seeing here as well, and so we are starting to look at that. But again, this is just going to take another year or so before we have more concrete data to really um, to whether to answer whether those effects that we see are occasionally just you know maybe more anecdotal or whether that's a true effect thank you another question when you sample the um, lace bag do you count the um junk stage the juvenile or the adults or both so for our purposes at this point we're, we're sampling both so we bring the leaves back to the lab and every tree we sample anywhere from five to 10 mature leaves. Um, this first year we did 10 leaves. Um, we're actually talking about reducing that and going down to five leaves per tree, but then adding more trees to our, our sample sites. Um, but I would recommend doing both adults and juveniles if you can. But if you are constrained, um, I do think that... Um, 
you know, juveniles are probably the better measure of, of active infestation um, in terms of knowing what, you know, what reproductive stage the, the population is in. But adults are certainly easier and easier to do without, say, a hand lens. So it's hard to say, um, both if you can. Okay. What I wouldn't, the, the big concern though is, um, is not to count dead insects, not to count exuvia, and um, not to rely on leaf blotch as your only measure. So if, if people are walking around their field and saying, oh, I have really bad ALB because I see, you know, all this black stuff on the underside of my leaves, plus a large leaf blotch, the concern is that that could be an infestation from a few months prior. Right, so your your scouting isn't reflecting what's happening today, um, but you can take a pin out with you and just poke the bugs on the leaf, you know. And if you see them walking around, then you're you're good. But we see a lot of, especially after rainy periods, we see a lot of dead bugs on the leaves that have been killed by by fungi. But um, unless you take the time to poke them, you wouldn't know that necessarily, because you know, they look, they're so small. So you need to see them moving to make sure that they're not dead. Yeah, and just kind of jumping off of what Dara said, um, yeah, you, your leaves kind of uh, keep those blotches, even though, you know, these ALB colonies might be long gone. Um, you know, another sign too, is if you're looking at the underside and you're just seeing, you know, a lot of these, these insects and everything, if they look like they're covered with fungus, um, that sort of thing, then that's that's probably go typically going to be a sign that 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 colony is no longer sort of active on that leaf. Okay, another question: Do you know that the threshold of this space? Sorry, can you repeat that one more time? Oh, do you know the economic threshold? For this space. No, but we are um, we're starting to do some planning and we're submitting a grant to work on just that. Um, because we'd we'd like to be able to make some some determinations about the economic injury level and economic thresholds for management. Um, but right now nobody has made a recommendation to that effect. Um, mm -hmm. as far as we know, anywhere. And I think that that's really important because we need to know at what stage management needs to be applied. You know, whether that's, you know, when you see 10 juveniles per leaf or 30 juveniles per leaf, we're not really sure. And until we know how that number actually translates in yield, which might be different for different cultivars, it's really hard to say. But I do think that those threshold values are going to be cultivar specific because not all cultivars seem to respond to infestation stress the same way. So you could have 30 ALB on, you know, average on one tree and 30 ALB average on another tree. If they're two different cultivars, they could respond to that same amount of bugs totally differently. Meaning one won't develop large blotches, won't drop its leaves as frequently, and the fruit will be more intact, whereas another cultivar maybe develops really large necrotic blotches to the same number of bugs, drops their leaves more frequently, and therefore has a larger fruit decline. And that's that's really what we don't know. Okay, sounds a lot of work. A lot of work. <laughs> Somebody's got to do it. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Thank you. So Dara, one of the questions that I had is last time um, we actually met uh, when Jensen was here and we talked about controls, there were both conventional and organic controls. <clears throat> For those producers that you've worked with that have not done anything and just let uh, nature take its course, have you seen um, have you seen a major, major decline in their production? And is that usually just one, one crop? Or are you seeing um, that they miss two crops out of that? 
you know, so this is where making the, these determinations is difficult is that the reporting is a little bit spotty. Um, so some of our growers will say, oh yeah, I know our fruit this past year was a quarter of the size that it should have been. However, there aren't actual yield data to back that up. Okay. Um, so on top of that, there have been some concerns about overuse of say fungicidal products or things like overuse of copper that could have actually been driving that. So we don't know what those numbers really look like. So this year we're going to be starting for the first time to really seriously collect that information so we can really see what's going on. Um, but I think that that's something for everybody to start paying attention to. You know, the other thing that complicates that is that um, some of these varieties tend to be mass producing. So one year they tend to be heavy and the next year they tend to be light and that's a natural cycle for some avocado varieties. So then parsing that out with ALB influence is, is made a little complicated, which means we might be, you know, four, year, four or five years out from really having a definitive answer. Okay, okay. Um, I realized that um, just having, not having good um, canopy to shape the, the fruit itself uh, can cause some problems as well as um, not being able to, to produce photosynthesis. Yeah. So I know there's several different things that would play in there. Um, how have you all, um, how have the producers been dealing with uh, the defoliation? So do you guys recommend that people clean that up or no, because just the, just the reproductive cycle is happening there. So once those leaves fall, then they pose no problem. What's your recommendation on that? Yeah, I would say that generally that's the case. So if you have only a single cultivar in your for farm and and most of the trees are the same, you know, on the same phenology, meaning they're all losing their leaves all at once, I would say there's no need for necessarily, you know, a bunch of sanitation practices because those bugs don't have anywhere to go and the leaves are going to take several months to mature anyway. However, if you have different cultivars and their phenology is staggered, so you have one cultivar that's losing his leaves as another is just maturing, I would think that you would expect that those bugs are just going to hop. So they're going to go to the next one down the line. So in that event, I think it makes a lot of sense to apply an insecticide to your susceptible trees so that they don't get hits because you want to kill those existing bugs so they don't move to the next one. So what I would like to do in the next couple of years too, and this is where, you know, work with Jensen comes into play, but I'm really interested in, in, in nailing down the timing of those applications seasonally to maximize their effectiveness. Because say, you, if you applied a spray right as the leaves are about to drop, I'm not sure how helpful that is on those trees, right? Because those trees aren't the ones that need the spray necessarily, but you want to protect the next generation. So getting that timing right and on which which varieties I think is really critical. But there's been there's been you know increasing work about how applying your your heaviest insecticide um, right at that moment where populations are starting to increase is probably the best time of year and the best use of your money. Helps it's very the interesting. The foliage There's on the been, tree as long as you can, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So hopefully we have some some better information about that again in the next year or two. Do any of our attendees have any questions? You can just unmute yourself and ask. Could you give me a list of the um, different types of organic uh, sprays you've used and the ones that work the best. I'm, I was at the class and I remember neem being spoken about and that working fairly well. Yeah, um, Jensen does have a list that he put out. Um, I'm sure Jennifer can share that with you. I don't have it you know, in front of me. Okay. Um, you know, Impede works pretty well as far as organic label products. 
Historically, pyrethrins on their own are not particularly effective, neither are spinosad products. However, we did recently test Azera, which is a combination of pyrethrins and azadiractin, so the active ingredient in neem, and that actually seemed to be pretty effective. So um, that seems like a good option. But and like you anything- said, You said it's a combination of, uh, of which two? MP okay. and what? Uh, so Azera is a combination of pyrethrins and azadiractin. So it's like a pyganic neem combo. And is that something you buy combined or do you combine it yourself? It is something that's pre-formulated. Pre okay. Um, but yeah, so Jensen has a list because he did a full organic management trial looking at several, several different products and he has a rotational management recommendation. In okay, place. I'll look at that again. I'm just not on Molokai right now, so I, I don't mm -hmm. have that. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. I'll try to send that information out um, this week. Great. Thank you so much. And is this mm -hmm. uh, recording going to be available to us to review again? Yes, it will be available on YouTube and it's going to be at the UH ex Molokai Extension channel. I'll put that in the chat right quick. Thank you. How long has this bug been on Molokai? We thought we found it in August. However, um, it seems after uh, our last workshop and conversation um, that several people have seen it over the last year, um, but really didn't know what it was. And it's been on Maui for quite a while. Dara, can you attest to that? Um, you know, Rosemary might have the best information for Maui, but as far as I know, it has been on Maui about the same amount of time as Oahu and the Big Island. So I think it was also first detected in 2019. Mike, do yeah. you recall? Okay, Rosemary confirmed that, good. Yeah, so it, honestly, yeah, this at least probably that long. But again, kind of like with Molokai, it's possible it had been here a bit longer than that. But you know, if you know what you're looking for now when you drive around, around the island, you'll start to notice all the avocado trees because you'll recognize the blotches. Absolutely. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> every, every home we've gone to, and we're at a big avocado farm right now, um, it's everywhere. I, I, we everywhere. haven't seen any trees that don't have it on. Yeah, no, it's true. And you know, what's so incredible is late in the season, you know, it gets to the point where every single leaf on that tree will have a blotch, every one. And so we think that the bugs are just moving from one leaf to another. And as, as a clutch develops and all those adults come out, they disperse, you know, to go found a new, a new mm -hmm. site. And so before you know it, you know, the whole tree has them so uh, I'm, Dara, I'm, go ahead Dara I had I had a question I had um one producer who is um an uh, organic producer who uh was really curious as if they're if they decide they're not going to use chemicals is there some heavy pruning that they should do you know it's hard to say because I think that ultimately, if you further stress the tree by removing too much leaf material, um, you're gonna end up with the same result in terms of yield effects. Um, probably managing your populations early on, once your leaves start to mature to prevent the numbers from ever getting high is um, preferable. Um, it's hard though, you know, for our organic growers because there aren't any uh, magic bullets for this pest, unfortunately. Um, okay. I don't know. Basically, we're trying to uh, keep the numbers low, right? Manage the numbers versus control. 
right? You know, one of the things that I talked to David Cox about doing, and and he's organic, so this is been a, a bit of a difficulty finding an organic label fertilizer product. But we had talked about the idea of uh, managing tree stress through supplemental nutrition. And we don't have any data on that, but um, I think it's an interesting idea. And I, I'd love to hear if anybody tries that. <laughs> you know, we're, we're interested in how to relieve overall tree stress rather than necessarily trying to keep your trees 100% clean too. You know, you're, we're probably not going to be able to get to the point where we can keep the bugs off entirely, but you can keep them low and you can keep the trees happier. I think for Molokai, we've had such a drought and I'm sure the rest of the state too, that when this insect really hit this year, we really started noticing it because the trees were already stressed. Right. I will say one thing. We only had one tree that we just loved that we watered all the time during this drought. I would say probably three times a week for an hour, we put uh, heavy fertilizer on it and it's just as infested, if not more than the rest of our avocados. Um, that, yeah. that doesn't say anything about what you just said to negate that, I'm just saying. We figured that would be the healthiest tree and it isn't. Well, but I think how will that tree then respond in terms of fruit production though? Uh, that's a really good question. You know, so that, and I, I hope that we get to hear back from you at the end of the year. <laughs> you could help let I us know. I will. Um, but that is the real question, whether those types of mitigating factors can help offset infestation. Um, you know, for our more conventional growers, something as simple as a once a year application of a systemic like um, Admire Pro or Savant Savanto seem very effective and, and they, they don't really have to fight the pest so much. Um, so that's great. But most of our producers here aren't conventional. They are organic. And um, I wish we had better products to offer for that. But I think that for our organic producers, these multifaceted approaches are gonna be what's best between stress mitigation and then you know good timing of applications of organic label products and then multiple different approaches for those products. So things that you know, we've also been interested in potentially trying are more deterrent type compounds like kale and clay you know, a surround WT product to try to prevent the bugs from moving into the trees. So in our case, we get a bit too much rain usually to be able to do that here. But if you're in a drier location, that might be a good candidate for a product to try. And as far as I know, I don't think Jensen has tested surround. Did he, Jennifer? I don't think that was on the list. I'll have to look back at it. But I for some reason, I don't think that one was on the list. But Would you I might think that would you mind repeating what you said about, I don't know what kaolin clay is? So kaolin is, um, it's a clay and it's used in, a, there's a formulated ag product called Surround WP and it's made by, is it Valent maybe? Um, but it's it's miscible in water. So you, you mix it up, spray it in a tank like you would an insecticide. You can spray it to the underside of the leaves. So it won't affect photosynthesis. And it dries as like this chalky substance. And for a lot of insects, it's very deterrent. So they'll fly into the plant, they'll try to contact the leaf and it prevents them from smelling the leaf. It kind of blocks all the odor signals to their tarsi on their feet and on their mouth parts. And it's irritating. It kind of gets under the way diatomaceous earth is irritating to insects, the same thing. And so it's actually very effective um, but the, it also, because it's white, it's very reflective. And so the insects are just deterred visually too. They don't want to tend to move into that field. So like I said, I don't believe that there's any publications on that, but it's really being increasingly used um, as a deterrent in ag. Um, I think it's a very underused product. Great, thanks. I will try that. But again, it, it washes off with rain. so. 
Oh. It'd be pretty labor intensive if you're in a very wet location, but if you're in a drier location or you're just in a dry period and it's a good time to use it, you know, I think it's a good thing to have in your toolbox. So okay. Do you know if that's Omri approved? It is. Okay. Thank you. So is Azera. So is Impede. Um, I know a lot of our growers, instead of Impede, they're using Copa. But I haven't used that myself. We also tried a horticultural oil that was used in Florida against psyllids um, as an organic option. And we did not find that that was effective for this pest here. Anyone else have any questions? Darren, Mike, this has been super informative. I wanna thank you for, for hopping on with us today and sharing your knowledge and your wisdom and your, and your research with us. Um, I think that it will help us make better decisions and I, I personally look forward to um, hearing the results of the, of the work that you guys continue to do. Well, thank you. We're really happy to be here. And, um, you know, for everybody who's, who joined the call today and just hang in there and feel free to reach out if you ever, you know, have any questions. And I would like to just say one more thing. I was very fascinated by what you said about what happens if you do nothing and you let nature take its course. And I'd be very curious about what happens to those people who, uh, who do that. Um, sometimes nature has a way of fixing things. Yep. So yep. I, I do, I do think you're probably on to something there, you know, with any new invasion event, there tend to be um, peaks early on in the first mm -hmm. few years. And then the systems kind of learn how to deal with it a little bit better, you know, predators get wise to their new prey and everything like that. So, you know, the next few years are probably going to be the roughest and then it'll get better. Yeah. Thank you so much. Do you, um, do you already have a list of plants that you're looking at trying in your insectary? We do. So we're going to be testing buckwheat, dill, coriander, cosmos, and um, well, here I've got the box next to me with my seeds that I have to go plant soon. Cilantro, cosmos, fennel. Um, you know, I've also been thinking that we should throw in some milkweed. Okay, wonderful. And how big a, are you doing this like um, in the row or are you just doing this um, somewhere near, near an orchard? Great question. So we're doing it in the planting. Okay. Um, but for the trial that we're about to put out, we actually, I'm meeting with the master student this Friday to talk about what he wants, you know, what he's thinking. I'm letting him do a lot of the planning for this. So he's going to tell me how he wants these uh, put into the field, but I think they're going to be interspersed with the actual trees, either just under the canopies or in a row, you know, between the rows, rather than like, say, all on the perimeter. I really like that idea. I've done some research um, and some pollinator work in the past. And um, we actually did a, a training for pollinators for producers. And I really like the idea of ha having those companion plants there um, that are beneficial, not only for um, bringing in natural predators, but also just pollination in general. I, I really like right. that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You know, I think it's about creating a healthy agro ecosystem. Well, let's open it up for any more questions. Okay. Well, I don't could see. I, could I just ask one more what you were sure. just talking about? 
this is a trial that you're you're doing of trying out these different pollinator. It sounds like mostly flowering plants. Um, and has anybody had any luck with that anywhere? Yes. So the um, and because I don't want to take credit for this. So our our master's student Kevin Armstrong has been looking at the literature for plants that have a history, a published history of strong recruitment for specifically lacewing predators. So the green neuropteran um, predators with with juveniles that are called often trash bugs, you know, because they'll collect bits of dead bugs and things on their backs. But they're really voracious predators and they can consume hundreds of little aphids or lacewing babies or eggs, and all sorts of things. Um, similar to coccinellids. So, so that's, he's using data, not necessarily for ALB systems, but for general recruitment of lacewing predators. And there is quite a bit of data on that. And where would I see that data? I would look online and look at um, companion plantings, um, kind of like what Jennifer was talking about. Um, I can I can ask him to send me a few papers and see about forwarding them on. Okay, but you I, should be able to find stuff online about that. Okay, so I thought I heard two things. One was companion plantings, where you plant around the tree um, various pollinating things like cosmos and dill. And the other thing I thought I heard you say was bringing in a predator for the lace ring. And I don't know if I heard that correctly or not. No, so, well, there is possibility for augmentative control. So we could bring in the predators um, and hope that they stay put. But generally the better approach in my opinion is to encourage local predators that are already in the area to go into your, your crop space and stay there, right? You. So you wanna give them the resources that they need. Um, generally, if you try to bring in predators that aren't from there, you, know, you bought them from a company, you know, they don't know what, they don't, <laughs> this isn't where they chose to be, you know, and they're very quick to disperse and to move out again, so. Do you know if uh, ladybugs and praying mantis eat this lace wing? Sure. Because those are both already available. Yes. So ladybugs um, were, like I said in the presentation, so those steel blue ladybirds um, are really prevalent, prevalent in our fields, and uh, they do seem to be feeding on ALB. Um, I haven't seen any mantids out in the field. Have you, Mike? Um, no, I haven't. Yeah, but if you have access to them, you could um, certainly try to bolster their numbers. It won't hurt. And I just want to make sure everybody understands that there is a difference between the lace bug and the lace wing. Yes. So the, it is confusing. the terminology, yeah, it gets confusing. It does. That's why I try to say lace wing predator. <laughs> you know, it gets, it gets, it's a little, yeah. And um, do you know if the um, praying mantis is a predator of the lace wing? Um, I have not seen any information on that at this point. Okay. Thank you. Wow. Well, that's that's definitely something um, exciting to to look at. Um, let Kevin know if he needs a, a spot on Molokai to do some work. We wouldn't have any problems finding him a location. I will absolutely let him know. Yeah, I'm meeting with him Friday. Okay, perfect, perfect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we'll make sure he has a very, very good master's project yeah. with lots of sites. <laughs> well, if nobody else has any questions, um, I want to thank you all for joining us. I want to thank Mike and Dara for joining us and sharing all that they've shared. Um, and we will um, get some information sent out to everyone including uh, Jensen's list uh, from the last workshop on the um, on the uh, conventional and organic uh, controls. And if you have any questions in the meantime, my contact information is in the chat. 
So jhawk at hawaii.edu is my email. Um, if you did not receive a link for today's workshop and somebody else passed that along to you, just email me and let me know to add you to my list. Um, and then if you have immediate questions, you can text me at the number that is found in the chat. Otherwise, if there aren't any other questions, uh, I think that concludes our presentation for today. Thank you. Have a great day, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.